Welcome to the Bayesian Conspiracy. I'm Inyash Brodsky. I'm Stephen Zuber. And today we have with us, uh, is it Sergey? Serge, forget. Serge, okay. Welcome to the podcast. He is on the line with us from Moscow, right? Yeah, that's right. I'm here at the moment. Excellent. Uh, thank you for joining us at this with the weird time zone convergence. And you wanted to talk to us about biohacking. And I normally, when we have a guest on, I know something about the topic and I know absolutely nothing about biohacking. Uh, so you're going to have to hold our hands a bit through this. Unless, like Stephen, you have become super knowledgeable in the past weeks. Uh, let's pretend I haven't for the sake of the audience. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Cool. Well, I actually, I've listened to your podcast on no tropics, so you have to know something about it. So you, you know words like modafinil. So that, that, that already makes you more qualified than a lot of people about biohacking. Oh, great. Cool. So I guess the main idea of biohacking is that we as humans are um, obviously systems of um, biochemical reactions and uh, uh, we are uh, everything that we do depends on what's going on inside our body so uh, whether we have energy during the day whether we're in a good mood whether we're able to solve a complex problem whether we're able to have good productive relationships with other people, it really all depends on the state of our body and mind, on our hormones, on our neurotransmitters, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, biohacking, I think the core idea is uh, that we should use what um, science has discovered about our bodies to figure out how to make them work better for whatever objectives that uh, we have. So I... I'm an entrepreneur. I've uh, built a couple uh, big companies before. I started my last company was um, it's called Ostrovok. It's the largest online travel company in Russia. Um, and uh, I uh, was working as a CEO, working pretty hardcore hours um, and really, really stressful job. And I just started doing various experiments on what I can do related to my health and well-being that would also make me more productive and effective and competitive as a CEO. And it kind of started from some obvious things like, hey, sleep more. Yeah. And um, just sleeping more uh, starts having a lot of downstream interesting effects. Like I found that I would procrastinate much less and I would have fewer anger management issues because as a CEO, it's not the best thing when you flip the fuck out at the developer that screwed up right in front of the office in the middle of everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, essentially, I just started uh, with um, simple things like that and then gradually started adding more things. First, things like vitamins, things like understanding a little bit about my genetics. For example, I have a um, genetic uh, mutation that reduces my um, reduces the quality of vitamin B12. Uh, metabolism and uh, I need to take a lot of vitamin B12 in order to uh, compensate for that and that's kind of had uh, effects on my uh, on my subjective well-being and also on objective um, on objective biomarkers tested in uh, in my blood and then I just kept uh, kept adding more and more and more to that uh, just because it seemed to, it seems like if you have an engineering mindset, you want to optimize the system that everything else is based on, that uh, all other things you do in life uh, are based on, and that is our body and our mind. And so I started doing things like taking Adderall and Modafinil, uh, doing things like uh, sleep trackers to figure out exactly what um, – uh, my optimal sleep times are. And then I started really going into pretty deep stuff. So now, by now, I have a medical team uh, led by Dr. Peter Atia, who's like pretty famous in the whole biopacking and um, health optimization community guy who's focused a lot on things like ketosis, which is, um, uh, I guess, like a dietary intervention that's uh, uh, helpful, uh, and things like uh, heart disease prevention. And so by now, I do pretty sophisticated things, like I manage my hormones uh, quite extensively, so I tune my thyroid hormones uh, constantly, 
kind of like trying to push it into an area where uh, I'm not overdoing it, but at the same time, I have more energy, better mood, etc. I um, tune my um, testosterone cycle in like a fairly smart way. So essentially, uh, the testosterone cycle is a long cycle uh, of um, uh, biochemical interactions, which start with your pituitary gland that produces some hormones that are precursors to testosterone, then they get converted into testosterone, then that uh, partially gets converted into estrogen, and estrogen is received at the pituitary to um, to kind of close the cycle and tell the pituitary to produce less precursors to testosterone. So that's how the feedback loop works. And, um, and I had kind of low precursors, but average testosterone. So I essentially took some stuff that um, blocks estrogen receptors at the pituitary and thus increases signaling to produce more testosterone. But uh, instead of, you know, some guys in the gym who jack up on testosterone and uh, cause issues, I'm actually just signaling uh, better into that uh, pathway. So anyway, that, that was too deep into one of the particular examples. But I think if I give an overview, then biohacking really is um, about managing your health in a very proactive way and with specific objectives. So the main things that um, I would categorize it into is sleep and optimizing that, nutrition and optimizing that, um, exercise and optimizing that. Uh, and then the more sophisticated things are optimizing mental health and doing lots of tests to understand how your body works and where you have potential defects because of genetics or some other reason. And then uh, medicines and supplements and drugs uh, to essentially tune your body to where uh, where you want. So that's that's the overview, super high level of um, what I do. And I've written some very popular articles about this just on the side. I don't have any commercial interest in biohacking. I work in uh, uh, in tech, um, in things like e-commerce and artificial intelligence. But um, basically. Basically, this is something that's a very effective tool for me to enhance my competitiveness as an entrepreneur and to help me get uh, things that I want more of. So things like energy and good mood and cognitive ability and uh, yeah. um, presumably longevity as well. Okay. So, yeah, that's an overview. So well, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, can I can I jump in there real quick, Inyash? Yeah, go for it. Uh, two things. One, Sergey, I'd love for you to send us the. Um, sorry, I'm going to start over. I think my audio is coming in too hot. No, no, it's good. There, there we go. I mean, on my recorder, um, I could see it flaring there. So I was going to say, uh, that's a really cool overview. Thanks for um, uh, going through all that. Uh, I guess. Sorry, I got a little turned around there. Um, I had a couple. Of que- I had a couple of quick questions. One was, uh, you said you found out that you had a, a hereditary. Uh, predisposition to like poorly metabolizing B vitamins. Did you find that out through something like 23 and me or how did you come across that? Yeah, it was just, um, 23 and me, um, plus a, um, an interpretation service called Prometheus. Since 23 and me no longer provides interpretation of your genes because the FDA kind of cracked down, uh, right. on, but there are services that will take an API from 23 and me or like a data dump, and decode it. So Prometheus is one I really like. It connects to an open source, um, kind of like a Wikipedia for, uh, for uh, genetic mutations, SNPpedia, and it just analyzes all of your stuff and tells you, hey, these are the things that might have the biggest, um, uh, the biggest uh, impact uh, on you negatively or positively. So that was one component. And the other component is that I started doing a large number of blood uh, biochemistry tests. And I noticed that I had significant elevation of um, a protein called homocysteine, which is um, a protein that's associated with uh, a lot of negative health outcomes. And it's particularly elevated in uh, uh, vitamin B12 issues. And I have the mutation called MTHFR, which is uh, a thing that tends to interfere with uh, B12 metabolism. So I just started taking huge doses of uh, B12 
And I immediately noticed a large drop in that protein biomarker in homocysteine. And I also noticed um, a subjective improvement in well-being and things like uh, sleep quality and most of all emotional and mood control. And that's not entirely surprising because B12 actually has downstream effects on neurotransmitters and then production of things like dopamine and serotonin. And that's where um, that's where uh, that could have a potential impact. And that was one of the first things where I said, whoa, holy shit, (laughs) you know, um, this kind of thing can have a significant impact on my life. Let me dig more. I want a lot more of that. So, yeah. Uh, that's when I started digging in. Ah, that's really cool. How do you, uh, with the, you said you were taking the blood tests recently. How do you get these blood tests done? Um, well, I guess you have a, a team of doctors, but assuming that one didn't have a team of doctors, can can I just go into a clinic somewhere and ask them to draw my blood and send it somewhere? Or how does that work? So in the U.S., it's kind of complicated because the medical system is pretty screwed up, as yeah. I think everyone knows. <laughs> Uh, so it's a little bit harder, but there are a number of um, services that provide online blood testing. Um, I think uh, the one called Life Extension is pretty good, despite the um, the kind of weird and overselling name. But um, you essentially go and buy those online. Uh, you pick out the list of tests that you'd like to do. They send you the kits or uh, I think maybe you have a fl- local phlebotomist who can just draw your blood into the tubes and send it off to a lab. And that's how it gets um, uh, it gets done. So in the U.S., it's a little more complicated. Most labs will not do stuff without a doctor's prescription and also will be super expensive because, you know, the way it usually works in the U.S. is. The doctor prescribes one test for, you know, some specific disease. And, of course, the insurance company wants to bill $600 for that one test, even though the marginal cost of doing it is 50 cents. So essentially, you have to just look out for specialists. But there are uh, companies that already cater to uh, biohackers, the bigger or people who are just interested in preventative health. The bigger challenge is interpreting uh, the data. So some of it uh, is easy to interpret, but a lot of it is not. And there's not very many doctors out there who are kind of taking this proactive approach towards um, health management. Oh. How how much of a, well, you, you said the, the B12 uh, one was a major uh, help. It, that was the first uh, major intervention that you did? I wouldn't call it a major intervention, but it was a noticeable benefit. So one thing that um, I guess uh, the body is a very complicated system and there's a great deal we don't know about it. And one wouldn't expect to have, given that it's a system that was designed by evolution, you wouldn't expect it to have a lot of easy hacks that are so noticeable that you immediately uh, feel feel better. But I've done a number of interventions that were noticeable for my well-being. So, um, so one is B12. Another one is Adderall slash modafinil. So um, these are definitely not placebos. So mm-hmm. I started out um, actually the first first uh, thing I've ever tried uh, that had just like a psychoactive clearly effect on me is when I tried Adderall in um, in college and. Um, after I, I had to write lots of business school essays, like 15, and then I um, I realized 12 or 14 hours later that they were all done, and I still wanted to work. And I went home and ironed my socks and sorted them by color. Oh, wow. <laughs> so yeah, that was the point when I was like, "Whoa, this little thing had such a significant impact on my ability to work." And uh, after that, I um, I just I took Adderall for a while, uh, realized that it had some negative side effects that I found kind of annoying. Mm-hmm. The biggest two were that it kind of made me anxious. And it also it made it very easy to work on anything, um, but perhaps like not necessarily on something that's worth working on. So sometimes I would go off on a tangent and write some email extremely well when the email didn't fucking matter at all. 
and I would spend an hour and a half writing this amazing email. So uh, I switched from Adderall to modafinil, which is a very nice um, med that uh, there's a good uh, medical research base that suggests that it has no material side effects and that it has an impact on uh, human cognitive abilities, essentially one of the few, uh, very, very few interventions that appear to boost uh, executive function in healthy humans that are not sleep deprived. So I, I um, how often do you take that? Um, I take it every day. Oh, wow. You don't get, yeah. I, I, I've heard that taking it every day can be, you know, harmful, start to, to uh, add up to bad effects. You don't find anything negative? I, I don't. I think it's hard to, so I've actually, I've taken Adderall and Modafinil for about eight years. So like okay. seven years of Adderall every day. And then I managed to, so I was starting to find those um, kind of, uh, uh, especially the anxiety effects, they were unpleasant. And so I decided to just uh, ditch it and switch to Modafinil. And I, I don't think I see any issues. Modafinil in general is a very um, gentle med. Unless I guess you take lots and lots and lots of it, but I don't think I've seen any credible uh, credible evidence that it was harmful or that it could be harmful if you take it all the time. I imagine it probably becomes a little bit less effective if um, uh, you take it all the time, but I don't think like I, I find myself very productive uh, even though I take it every day. So you know whatever it is, it's not broken. Okay. That's what I've heard too. Is that it? It wears that a lot of people have uh, tapering off effects where they get reduced benefit from taking it every day. I'll take it yeah. on occasion, and I think the last most recent time was what Thursday, and uh, yeah, it's it's a really profound effect, but it's it's not like jittery like you mentioned, like Adderall. It's exactly. just uh, exactly. Uh, so I, I I found that is it's an effect that's kind of like your head is just more more clear, you know. Yeah. Um, constantly and it doesn't cause anxiety and it's just like a it's a reasonably uh, reasonably nice effect but by the way one thing that's important to mention is one of the biggest challenges in all of this personalized medicine and biohacking uh, areas is that different people react very differently to many compounds and to many uh, to many meds uh, partially for genetic reasons so it turns out that our liver uh, which obviously metabolizes medicines, uh, is one of the most heterogeneous areas of the human genome. And there's a good reason for that, because, you know, you would want to, if a tribe of humans found new berries or mushrooms and all ate, ate them, you don't want all of them to die. <laughs> uh, you want it to be very a very, very diversified uh, kind of part of the genome. But the consequence of that is that different people metabolize meds in very, very different ways. So my favorite example is codeine, which is um, um, a tranquilizer, essentially a painkiller rather, that uh, gets metabolized into morphine by the uh, liver. And so some people have the gene that um, have many copies of the gene that metabolizes codeine into morphine. And so they take some codeine that their doctor prescribed them and they get really fucking high, really <laughs> high and for like 10 minutes. And they call the doctor and say, doctor, that was awesome. Can I have more? It's only worked for like a little bit. And the doctor writes in his notes, potential drug addict. Don't mm -hmm. give any more morphine derivatives. So um, and then someone else might have no copies of the gene. And so the codeine just goes into the bloodstream as an inert molecule that doesn't do anything. And the guy calls the doctor and says, like, doc, doc, this thing is not working. Can you give me more? And the doctor makes that same <laughs> note about how the guy is a drug addict. And um, this is just one illustration of, um, you know, how primitive modern medicine is and also how heterogeneous we are as humans and how hard it is to make to build scalable solutions out of uh, personalized medicine. So, yeah. So we I mean, we've covered the nootropics once before, and I think we've many times said the the great values of uh, of getting good sleep and exercise. So I wanted to go a little deeper into the other things. Then, 
I think sure. right now the biggest thing that would stop me is just not knowing how to get started on all of this. Like, how? Uh, what would you recommend for someone who wants to get something like this initiated? So, you took that I, question right off my list, Ian. Way to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I wrote like a um, uh, couple big articles uh, around this, so I'll um, just send you the links to my blog, and you can. Um, read those. They're like, you know, 30, 45 minutes just to read the articles and it includes all my tests and uh, uh, all of that stuff. So you can read that for just to get a sense of the details. But I would definitely start with sleep. So sleep is one that has a very significant impact. And there's a number of um, of uh, uh, things that most people do wrong with sleep. So the biggest ones are, first of all, shifting sleep time uh, from day to day. So the reason that you don't want to do this is because uh, so sleep is driven by two specific uh, cycles uh, in our in our brains. One is the sleep pressure cycle, which is that when you wake up, uh, a protein called adenosine uh, starts accumulating in your brain. And that's actually the protein that gets inactivated by by coffee, which is why coffee staves off sleep. So the more adenosine appears in the brain, the more desire to sleep uh, there there is. At, and at some point you fall asleep and that's when adenosine gets uh, cleared out of the brain. And at the same time, there's another cycle, which is the circadian rhythm, which is melatonin and essentially exposure to sunlight, etc. And if those two cycles go out of whack, where let's say this today you go to sleep at nine and tomorrow you go to sleep at one and the next day you go to sleep at 10, then those two cycles are misaligned. And some of your sleep stages, especially the early um, sleep stages, which is where a lot of deep, slow wave sleep happens. So some of them will just perform in a suboptimal way. And the important thing to realize is that sleep is actually not passing out. Sleep is a very, very active uh, state when a lot of bodily and body and brain systems get repaired, cleaned, rejuvenated, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there's a bunch of stages that the body go- that a sleep goes through, and all of them are important. And essentially, if you're shifting uh, your sleep time, it's almost like you're living in a permanent state of jet lag. And you're disrupting some of those stages quite severely. So you're not disrupting your sleep by 10%. It's more that you're taking a particular stage of it and degrading it by, I don't know, 70% or 80%. And uh, that has a lot of negative effects, both short term and actually long term, uh, long term as well. So this is one thing. It's just sleeping at the same time. Uh, every day. So I try to not shift my sleep by more than 20 minutes uh, a day. Uh, It's really hard. It's really hard, especially with travel. But when I manage to get this done for several weeks in a row, um, I just know that I feel much better. My mind is sharper, etc. The next big thing is to sleep uh, enough. So it's really important to get something like at least seven, seven and a half hours of real actual sleep. And what that means since sleep efficiency for young, healthy people tends to be around kind of 92%. So you, you spend 92% of sleep if you're doing a good job out of sleep, maybe 85 or 80 if you're doing a bad job out of sleep. So essentially, if you're, if you're spending seven and a half hours in bed, you're actually sleeping for probably like six and a half hours. And uh, again, there's some sleep stages that happen towards the end of the night. They're essentially like a particular substage of REM sleep. And um, if you sleep for six hours instead of, uh, you know, seven and a half or eight hours, then you significantly degrade those stages and the functions that uh, these stages have. So I think, those two are by far the biggest things to do with um, improving sleep. There's a bunch of other more minor things. So I try to wear uh, orange kind of blue light blocking glasses um, several hours before sleep. I don't drink caffeine for at least eight hours before sleep. So this is another thing, by the way, connected to genetics. 
So about half of us are slow caffeine metabolizers and half are fast. The fast metabolizers metabolize caffeine with a half-life of about five hours, which means that, you know, if you uh, drink caffeine five hours before sleep, then you still have half of it um, in your brain binding adenosine at the time you go to sleep, and that's potentially uh, potentially disruptive. And if you're a slow metabolizer, I think your half-life um, for caffeine is like nine hours. Ooh. And basically, you shouldn't really be drinking coffee at all because you're going to disrupt your sleep unless you drink it at like eight in the morning. So that's an interesting thing. I used to drink coffee up until 6 p.m. and think, oh, you know, three hours is enough. But actually, caffeine half-life is pretty long. I lately yeah. started drinking coffee again a cup a day, and it is it is kind of ruined my last week. So I'm going to completely cut that crap out again. Yeah, you should ch- check out whether you, whether you're a fast or slow metabolizer. And did you, did you do those tests? No. So this is 23andMe is the first step. Yeah, that's the cheapest step. Um, so do 23andMe. They'll send you the data. And then uh, you connect it to the service I mentioned earlier, Prometheus, pay them like five bucks, and then they'll give you a report, and that report you can easily parse. So it's like a searchable archive uh, with a nice UX uh, that uh, you're going to be able to see, uh, hey, um, like search for sleep or for whatever else you're interested in and see all the genes you have that are associated with uh, that particular phenotype. Interesting. You just also, sorry to go on a tangent. You said UX. That's the first time I heard that. Is that user experience? Yeah, yeah. Uh, user experience. Interesting. Okay. It's, uh, sorry. This is like a thing. Uh, if you're, if you've been building websites or mobile apps. Okay. So, no, um, I, I always heard UI before, but, uh, not UX. Uh, these two are slightly different. Um, the, UI the interface think, is how it looks. The, exper- the yeah. user experience is how it feels to use it, exactly. right? Huh. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. All right. Sorry. I didn't um, mean to get off on a tangent there. Oh, no, you're good. Yeah, I was going to mention, too, I, I've been taking the last week or so extended release caffeine pills because I don't drink coffee, but I'll tend to take a caffeine pill in the morning. And uh, for whatever it's worth, I got these on Amazon for like 15 bucks for a hundred of them. And uh, they're so far about, I don't know, a week or two in, they're doing pretty well for me. I find that I'm not tapering off around like 11 or noon like I would if I took a regular caffeine pill first thing in the morning. Mm-hmm. And it metabolizes to be about 100 milligrams caffeine. Um, Interesting. But I was, I've never tried those. Oh, the, I mean, yeah, they're, I'd give them a shot if you're, you know, if you use caffeine to supplement your alertness. I mean, I imagine if you're taking modafinil every day, you probably don't use caffeine on the daily, but maybe you do. Um, I do because I already know. So modafinil and caffeine do combine, so you got to be cautious with this because you might get overstimulated, and that's going to be unpleasant. Mm-hmm. But... Um, uh, I've been taking this for so long that I kind of know how much coffee I can drink and I know the symptoms if I'm drinking too much. Plus, I just really, really like the taste of caffeine and it's kind of uh, my um, morning psychological trigger for starting to work. So I kind of have a very, very, very standardized day when uh, where I will get to a coffee shop around like 7 or 8 a.m. and uh, work there for six or seven hours uh, every day. And it, it's kind of like my morning routine, which uh, really triggers me into into uh, working well and kind of being in the flow all the time. <laughs> I love that oh, your morning awesome. routine starts with working for six hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's um, I, I really like that because um, it's um, uh, so if I wake up and quickly get to doing a bunch of deep work where I can focus without anyone distracting me at an office or something like that, then by 1 or 2 p.m., I feel like I've done an enormous amount of productive work and the entire day is still ahead of me. So it's it's a pleasant sensation because then later on in the day, I can just relax without the feeling of guilt that I ha- have to be doing something. Oh. Uh, plus... The sense of flow is so enjoyable. It's it's one of the nicest, I think, things in life is when you get super, super deeply engaged into something. Yeah. So, okay. I like that a lot. Uh, it, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, can we go to the testosterone cycle then? How did you, how did you start testing for that? So, um, I gradually just read a bunch of, um, 
just uh, online materials and books and that kind of thing on uh, health uh, just over time by myself. I've been doing this for about five years, I think, uh, five, six years. And um, uh, I started just reading. There's a very nice book by Ray Kurzweil called Transcend, The Nine Steps to Living Well Forever. Hmm. And it's a very good overview of a lot of the basics in terms of um, in terms of kind of personalized uh, personalized healthcare, and um, so I just looked at all the tests that people are commonly doing in labs for various um, uh, disorders or uh, for uh, various diseases, etc. And I just decided, hey, I'm going to do all of this. And I've I've done tests. I've, I've done like hundreds of tests at once. Uh, where I would go into a lab and give them like 35 vials of blood and, um, and, uh, uh, they would send me like a huge amount of data that I would have, um, uh, an assistant enter into an Excel spreadsheet. And then I would go and just like research and geek out and try to figure out what those numbers, uh, what they actually mean. And, I just saw, so with testosterone specifically, I mean, obviously it's quite a famous molecule because, hey, you're supposed to get better muscles and you're supposed to have better sex and you're supposed to uh, basically feel better, be in a better mood, be more energetic, more confident. That all sounds fucking great. So definitely serve me up for more of that. And I tested my levels over uh, years and kind of saw uh, that, um, you know, it was like... um, average-ish, and uh, I'm not one of those people that's content to uh, (laughs) have an average result at something. Uh, Plus, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I grew up on role-playing games a lot, Mm -hmm. and for me, this whole thing is like, okay, you just got plus one to testosterone. This is a primary stat that gives you plus 10 minutes per day of uh, energy, that kind of thing. So, uh, essentially I was just, uh, uh, kind of asking myself, okay, can I do something about this? And with testosterone specifically for a long time, I wouldn't really touch it with any direct intervention. So it, it has, it's affected by a lot of, um, a lot of, um, kind of, uh, things like, uh, exercise, uh, in the right way and sleeping the right way. But before I started doing like hormone treatments, I only really dared do those once I got uh, proper doctors advising me because the hormone systems are fairly complicated. And um, so specifically for testosterone, you can have uh, biochemical bottlenecks in quite a large number of different uh, of different parts of the testosterone cycle. So it could be that your problem is that too much testosterone gets converted into estrogen or that uh, not enough testosterone is um, released into free testosterone, which is the biochemically active part because you have too much of the protein that binds uh, free testosterone, that kind of thing. And if you do something wrong there, then it's quite easy to screw yourself up. So specifically with hormones, I think it's really important to... Um, be very sure uh, that what you're doing is is the right thing. Consult with an endocrinologist and uh, etc. So it's just like kind of a tricky, potentially uh, potentially dangerous uh, thing. But I have seen very nice uh, effects. So the testosterone bit was definitely very noticeable. So um, it was a noticeable boost to energy. It was a noticeable boost to uh, to uh, basically mood and it was a noticeable boost to just like being horny all the time. <laughs> so, um, and I had like a very, so, so the way we tuned that particular bottleneck that I have, I had a very good reaction to it. So my testosterone, my free testosterone rose by about 80%, uh, over two months and has stayed there ever since for the last, I guess, like year and a half that, um, that uh, I've been tracking that since uh, we started doing this intervention, so it's it's quite a significant um, quite a significant change. So it sounds like this is one of the ones that is not uh, very easy to hack by yourself. You need uh, medical professionals for this. Yes, and I think um, so. Hormones in general, 
uh, a lot of people appear to have screwed up hormones for whatever reason. It could be um, bad sleep practices. It could be um, some toxic crap that we breathe when we live in cities. It could be stress related. But um, but hormones, I think, like from what I've seen of other people's results, just about everyone has some kind of hormonal issue. And um, hormones are a very actionable thing um, that can mostly be be tuned. But it's also something that, uh, yeah, you're exactly right. It's it's something that takes professional help to really interpret in in the right way. Because I mean, if you start searching about that stuff online, you're gonna have these crazy diag- biochemical diagrams of you know this thing converts into that thing. And it's just very hard to understand unless you've been uh, doing this for a while. So what are like the easier things that we can do uh, at home with, you know, kits that we order? Uh, sure. So so I think, um, well, the first thing I think that's really important to figure out is what you want. So what your specific objectives are. Some people are very big on longevity. Uh, other people are very big on things like mood and energy. I mostly, my primary concern is really to do with, um, to do with performance because I think the longevity, uh, part of, um, uh, the longevity part of things, I think other people will solve for me by the time, uh, my natural health span, uh, and lifespan, uh, is up. So, uh, given, given where, the way the trends are going, but, uh, so I think, the most important thing is to just start with the why uh, you are doing this. And um, if your goal is, um, let's say, energy and mood, then definitely sleep. Definitely. Um, so exercising in the right way and really the right kinds of exercise, um, the, the best kinds of exercise for for downstream hormonal and metabolic impacts are First of all, hip hinge exercises, so things like deadlifts and squats and um, leg presses. Hmm. And the reason those are very effective is because you're exercising the by far the largest muscles of the body. So your leg muscles and your glutes, they're really, really large, and they're relatively far from your heart. So you're essentially really uh, getting much more bang for the buck from one squat than you, are, than you do from one bicep curl. So... If you are doing, if you're doing, uh, a lot of things like hip hinge exercise, kind of reducing your fat, um, percentage, upping your muscle percentage, then that's helpful because your body is just, uh, there's, there's, I, I don't think I'm the best person to really describe all of the, um, uh, all of the effects, but you do get more energetic. You do get more hormone production, uh, from, uh, from those things. Another thing I would, um, look into is um, called high intensity interval training. So that's uh, the main idea is that instead of, you know, running on the treadmill for an hour at the same pace, you do really, really aggressive kind of uh, speed ups and slow downs. So where you will warm up for five minutes, race all out for 20 seconds, rest up for a minute and a half, uh, race up for 20 seconds again, and do that like eight times in a row. And what that does is it stimulates your uh, cardiovascular system to improve because you're kind of pushing it to the limit. And it's also stimul- it also stimulates more mitochondria to appear in your cells because you're also pushing uh, the cells uh, to the limit. And those things appear to be having um, an impact on energy kind of down down the line. So... Uh, in terms of if, if you want to specifically talk about meds and um, things like um, things like that, then I mean, modafinil definitely gives energy, as I think you know you've um, uh, as you've obviously experienced. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I, I think it, it really have to think about what exactly you want and uh, kind of take a systematic approach and gradually look for opportunities to uh, get some kind of results. And then when you get a quick win of some kind, then you will find additional motivation to keep exploring, uh, to keep exploring this. So, yeah. 
How hard is it to find these wins with things like 23andMe and uh, and Prometheus? It's not trivial. Um, it's 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 not trivial. So I think uh, it's much harder than to find uh, quick wins with just uh, things like sleeping well and eating right and um, and exercising right and meditating and getting psychotherapy or whatever. So uh, digging into biochemistry is harder just because um, a lot of people have fairly unique situations. And there's a lot of data out there that you can get, but it's really hard to uh, interpret that data without just like spending a lot of time researching about it yourself and talking to people who are knowledgeable and um, just really digging. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, uh, so, that's where the hacking part comes in, right? You got to sit down and actually really do the work. Yes, exactly. And I think that it's totally worth it because you know, it, it is um, it is a thing that affects um, everything else. So I, I think in general, going um, moving into the future, uh, people who really heavily invest into this kind of thing will be able to uh, will be able to use it to develop additional wealth, not just financial, but also intellectual, because, you know, um, because because I have this uh, additional energy, I can spend time, uh, you know, taking cool courses on Coursera and, uh, you know, learning about uh, biochemistry or about nanotechnology or something else. And that's uh, that's an asset that um, that uh, I build. And that asset, I think, in the future is going to help uh, develop more financial returns, more uh, intellectual returns, et cetera, that can be reinvested into more biohacking. And that's where the whole thing with um, uh, divergence in um, human capabilities is uh, is going to happen. I think it's already is happening, especially as more and more technology is going to appear, more and more data, more ability to interpret the data, uh, etc. So it, it, it seems like I almost feel like uh, this is a necessity if you want to be uh, working in a highly competitive area or if you want to uh, you know, achieve something really, really major that a lot of other people want to uh, to achieve. It's really you've got to understand how your body works and um, figure out how to tune it, or you're running the risk of basically becoming obsolete um, because other people will do it, and uh, the returns in society are going to consolidate to those people. And uh, you know, you don't want to be off of that bandwagon. If you were to say get these tests done and or run a twenty three and me and go through an interpreter, do you think like one weekend of sitting down for twelve hours a day for two days in a row would be enough, or is this like a multiple weekends long sort of a project? Good question. I really like how you ask that. Um, I think that in one, I think in two days of intensive focus, you will understand a lot. So the first day, you're just going to read a whole bunch of stuff and it'll all feel very confusing and overwhelming. And then, you know, you can sleep on that for several days and then come back to it again. And um, so I think I think it's more of a one weekend will get something uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. There's specifically in terms of 23andMe, there's not that many genes that are very well known in terms of their effect. So the one that I have uh, a mutation in is a fairly well known one. Um, there's other ones. There's some that are specifically like introduce significant cancer risks or something like that. There's uh, uh, one particular gene that introduces um, or reduces Alzheimer's risk. That's quite important, but not that many genes are well mapped out. If you, I think that what's more actionable is if you take, if you do lots of blood tests. So, and really test out your, um, uh, lipid profile. So kind of how much heart disease risk you have, your home hormone profile. So, uh, you know, you, you might not want to do something with that without a professional, but at least you'll know that there's something potentially interesting. Uh, your glucose metabolism. Uh, profile. Um, by the way, all, all of this is also listed in my uh, in my article, so you'll be able to see kind of all the tests um, 
that uh, that I've done, and you can just copy that. Oh, perfect. Uh, so I, yeah, yeah, totally. And um, that's the that you can definitely get value out, out of in a weekend because you're gonna find that, for example, you might have some lipid screw up. Uh, and, uh, you know, that means that you should be more cautious about things like uh, heart disease risk uh, over time. Or you're going to find out that uh, you have really shitty vitamin D, which most people have uh, in uh, uh, in the northern hemisphere anyway. Well, I guess not in the latitude that you guys and I live at. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, uh, things like that, you're definitely going to find uh actionable useful stuff in a weekend of digging into the data and to get that data uh like you said find a um google like a phlebotomist get a bunch of blood draws and then take them to a lab will the lab do it without a doctor's prescription so uh, there are some people who will do it so if you google um these guys called life extension foundation mm -hmm. um they're a website that sells fairly high quality supplements and they also sell blood tests. So, for example, I'm just going to Google this real quick. So, let's make homocysteine life extension. Anyway, I, I, can't, I can't quite find it. But if you, if you just um, go on their website and um, check out the different, um, the different tests uh, that uh, – oh, yeah, there we go. So, you go to lifeextension.com blood tests and then you know you can see for example um let's see b12 status panel um and for 50 bucks they will test um several things related to your vitamin b12 metabolism or for you know um for let's see for 70 bucks, they will test your free testosterone and total testosterone. So it's still it's not cheap, but it's it's much much cheaper than uh, than lab testing, mm -hmm. um, and you can just uh, buy that online. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how the blood draw stuff works, but um, uh, there's phlebotomists. Um, I don't know. In San Francisco, I had a phlebotomist who would come and draw my blood for like 30 bucks. Nice. Um, or whatever tests uh, I wanted, and they would just come to my apartment and do it in the morning. So it's it's um, uh, other countries. It's it's much easier. So in Russia, I get I think like 150 different uh, biomarkers tested for a total of I think like by now 400 bucks, okay. uh, 450 bucks. So uh, in the U.S., it's going to be more expensive, but um, you can definitely um, get a lot of this stuff done. Excellent. Uh, I personally take NAD plus every every day um, supplements. Do you do you have you looked into those at all? Do you know anything about it? Um, I take NAD plus. So I think um, with supplements, uh, my philosophy is basically as as follows. I, I actually I take a shitload of supplements. I take I think sixty or. 70 pills a day. Holy shit. Really drawing that inspiration from Ray Kurzweil. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's not including the prescription drugs. So prescription drugs, I think I take about 12 or 13. Um, but uh, with supplements, I mean, my, my philosophy is pretty simple. So um, the most important thing is to make sure that the supplement cannot be harmful. And certain supplements, like iron supplements or calcium supplements, it, it is possible for them to be harmful, although they could also be situationally useful, depending on uh, what you have um, what you have going. Uh, but most supplements are definitely not harmful because, you know, taking, I don't know, green tea extract or, you know, vitamin B12 or omega-3 fish oil, uh, you know, those things are mostly food, just concentrated food, and you're making sure that you get plenty uh, plenty of them. And um, um, I imagine that probably half of the stuff I take is completely useless, <laughs> but I don't know exactly which half it is. <laughs> and some of them are plausible. It's plausible that they are useful. 
and none of them are likely to be harmful as long as you know you buy them from very highly reputable high quality suppliers and you're careful and you know you make sure that um uh that uh you're not taking something that is actually going to uh be uh bad for you so i, I kind of take the philosophy of like hey you know i'll collect the uh, potential upside plus i get placebo value i think placebos are fucking awesome so because you have no downside you just have upside and you just have to believe in it <laughs> so yeah that's, that's like a fairly well well reproduced effect uh in in medicine although some people challenge its existence but you know um it, it's just so with supplements i think most of them i don't know how useful they are um, but I still take them because they could be useful. Okay. Do you got anything, Stephen? So my, my goals basically are to feel more alert and more cognitively engaged throughout the day. So I, I've been, uh, the last several months, I've been going to the gym a few hours a week, um, working on better sleep. Uh, but that's really where, what I wanted to ask you about. So I historically am always a terrible sleeper. Um, I've got a nice bed, comfortable pillow. Um, I keep the room at a good temperature. I do all the, what I feel like the external things I can do, but I sleep poorly every, basically every night. There's a few nights a year where I wake up and feel like, oh man, I feel great. Most of the time I go to bed tired and wake up tired. So like, do you have any, uh, have you discovered anything for, um, people who try to have good sleep hygiene, but sleep poorly nonetheless? So, um, there's, I think several things I would look into. One is, um, first of all, just make sure that you measure it. So, um, by like, um, I really like, uh, Aura, O-U-R-A. It's a ring type device that, um, that, uh, tracks your sleep by essentially flashing <laughs> light, uh, through the thin part of the skin under the finger and, uh, figuring out, uh, stuff to do with blood, uh, pressure. Sorry, not blood pressure. Um, uh, heart rate, heart rate variability, et cetera. So that's just a useful, um, useful tool to really figure out what is going on, whether you're waking up a bunch of times at night and you don't remember, or you're not getting uh, enough of a particular sleep stage or something else. That's the first thing. Um, another thing I would consider is going to a sleep lab. So um, a sleep lab is basically where you go and sleep in the hospital and they will hook you up to a bunch of um, equipment uh, like, um, uh, you know, those caps uh, on your head and uh, oxygen sensors and stuff like that. And sometimes uh, people find that they have a sleep disorder, for example, sleep apnea, which is a condition where... Uh, people, uh, essentially, uh, people's, um, oxygen, uh, supply gets a little bit disrupted at night and it makes them wake up, uh, like have a tiny awakening and then fall back asleep without noticing, but it's disrupting, to, uh, the sleep stages. So I would test for that. And then after that, I would, um, kind of keep track with the aura ring and experiment. So try not eating. Um, uh, after like 3 p.m. Try meditating before bed or just like doing something really, really relaxing. Uh, I mean, definitely don't drink coffee or alcohol because those two are really disruptive to, uh, to sleep. And, and I guess just keep, keep like reading about the issue because sleep is like a super, super complex human behavior and we don't know that much about it. Uh, there's a great book you should read called Why We Sleep. It's uh, by um, the guy who's the head of um, the Berkeley Sleep Lab. Uh, awesome book, like really easy to read and tells a lot about, you know, what we've learned about sleep and what kind of experiments are going on uh, in uh, sleep research right now, etc. And I've just learned a lot from it. So I think those are some things. Try different temperatures. So I found that I need to be cold in order to sleep well. So I need to be at 18 degrees Celsius. I don't remember what that is in Fahrenheit, but it's basically fairly chilly. 
Um, how, how, how long has uh, it been since you have slept uh, like on your own? I know a lot of people who are in relationships uh, will actually get separate beds because just your partner moving can sometimes make things harder on you. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. So I've been, uh, I've had a partner sleeping in my bed for, we share a bed rather for like the last seven years. This has been going on longer than that. And I, okay. I wake up, I'm, I'm aware of the wake ups that I have in the middle of the night. Huh. I'm basically aware of, well, I guess I can't say every toss and turn cause I don't know the ones I'm not aware of, but I'm aware of several per night. I just get up, you know, change orientation, roll over, go back to sleep or something. Um, but I'm aware of a lot of those. I think I'm just a light sleeper. Might yeah, be part that of sounds problem. awful. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm used to it, but yeah, it does kind of suck. I'm tired a lot, so um, yeah, yeah, I'll check out the aura ring. That's just pretty cool. Uh, I think I think just experiments. I mean, some people find really weird things will help them sleep. So, for example, I sometimes find that if I take a really cold ice shower, um, it actually knocks me out after I get under the covers. So it's just like experiment and try to find out what um, uh, the drivers of quality sleep sleep are for you we, okay cool we are coming up on our hour uh steven did you have other things um yeah i was actually just curious in general um how did you find out about the podcast i'm we, that is our first uh, international conversation here um i um i'm into the whole rationalist community um i'm one of the people that really want to live forever and merge with the uh, machines in some way and um, essentially uh, essentially I, I find the a lot of the discussions in the rationalist community to be interesting so you know I'll read Star Slate Codex um, uh, etc et although I think Scott Alexander doesn't like me because uh, <laughs> uh, because uh, he thinks that I'm too aggressive in uh, in my articles that I write and that uh, I give transhumanists a bad name so, um, so I, I think I just found you guys through some, uh, part of that. And I listened to a number of podcasts and liked them. And then I saw that, uh, Rob, uh, McIntyre, who I know through Y Combinator, um, has, um, had a couple of podcasts with you guys. And I'm like, Oh, you know, I love the rationalist community. I want to go talk, um, to these guys. Awesome. Awesome. Well, yeah, I'm glad you got in touch. This has been really cool. No, that's really interesting. And uh, no, I'm glad you reached out. This has been really fun to learn about. And uh, I mean, I think if if Scott Alexander, you know, said anything bad about you, I think that that's that's how you know you've made it, right? If somebody as big <laughs> as Scott is, is giving you a hard time. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I, but uh -huh. go ahead. I, okay, I do have one one final sort of question, which is tangentially related. So. I, I like all this, you know, life being awesome and being productive and all this, but I also go out generally once a week where I am up really late and it throws off my sleep schedule and I drink alcohol and that fucks everything up. And is this just something that is not possible to do or I have to accept that I'm going to have, you know, a, a lower productivity in my life if I do this every week? Because I really enjoy it. I think it's important to... Just, you know, decide what um, kind of trade offs you want to make where, because I mean, uh, anytime you change your sleep schedule significantly, it's going to have some negative effects. So I'll do this from time to time as well. And I, you know, we haven't talked about it, but I'm really big on using things like MDMA and LSD for biohacking purposes um, uh, as well. MDMA is a great drug for helping kind of um, uh, social intelligence and helping, uh, I guess, especially for someone introverted to help develop social skills and extroversion and that kind of thing. Oh. But, um, uh, you know, every time I take something like that, uh, that is uh, part of, um, you know, a night long thing. And that knocks out my uh, sleep schedule for the next uh, several days. So I think it's just most of the time, like I don't like alcohol because I think it's um, just like there's better ways to get high. It is and, one of the shittiest drugs. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, 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 it is really bad for you. And I feel bad after um, after I drink alcohol. And so I just completely gave uh, gave that up. But um, I mean, 
you know, there's always trade-offs in life. So I th- I guess like you gotta just like say, okay, this is what I want and this is why I prefer to keep uh, this particular thing. Plus, you know, for me, like I cannot fully kick sugar because I'm, I'm quite addicted to it. I, I sometimes manage to go without sugar at all for like a month, wow. but uh, then I'll have a stressful event of some kind and I'll start eating some cookies and then, you know, it just goes downhill from there. So, you know, I, I don't I, I don't think it's possible to just like be perfect with respect to all these these things uh or to be like super religious about it it's important to just say hey like here are the impacts this is having and uh i want to make better choices generally some choices will still be bad but that's just you know part of the human condition yeah awesome well i think i think i have covered most things i wanted and we're running low on time did you have any last things Stephen? I have uh, one last question, not at all related to the previous topics. Um, I was, you know, we don't get someone from Moscow on the line uh, so far ever, <laughs> um, and and I can't help but ask: uh, Is there any sentiment, you know, to the to the average citizen over there, uh, or rather, what is the sentiment regarding uh, President Donald Trump within the U.S. or is that come up over there? I I'm curious to sort of what the feeling is on the ground. Um, it's I, I think I'm not the right person to ask because I'm. You know, I, I live part of the time in the U.S. and part of the time here and part of the time in Europe. And I, I kind of grew up in the U.K. and the U.S. So I, I, I get the sense that um, I get the sense that uh, people here, uh, I don't even know, actually. So I think people when he won, a lot of people were quite happy with uh, with that. Um, but. Um, yeah, I, I have no idea. And I, I try to one of the big things that I try to do as part of my work related to mental health is I just try to really not get exposed to that stuff at all. Because, <laughs> That's um, fair. Yeah. I mean, it, it's just n- news and social media and all of that stuff. I think that they kind of suck uh, time and attention. And I think you know, they actually kind of reduce intelligence because if we think about intelligence as an applied ability to, you know, focus and get stuff uh, done. So I've really deliberately, so I, I have like all the news, um, like uh, the New York Times or Wall Street Journal, et cetera, I have it, I have it banned on all my devices. Um, so I can't actually go, even go and see it. And I've been trying to kind of get off of that because I mean, I cannot do anything about Donald Trump or about Kim Jong-un or about Putin. So it's outside of my circle of influence. So, I mean, I kind of shouldn't care, especially since the media really makes um, quite a negative narrative mm-hmm. out of uh, the whole thing. And I feel like if I listen to that a lot, then it will make me more stressed and it will make me a more negative person. So I, I, I take the idea of like filtering my own information space uh, quite seriously, because it's almost like, hey, if you listen to Donald Trump, then some of your neurons become orange. You know, <laughs> why would you yeah, I've I every think that's now a very good answer. Every now and then, I have a news blackout just for like a week, and and I noticed that nothing like the the news you get is not actionable. You know, if exactly. someone in Washington is doing something, what the hell are you gonna do? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And and if there is some news that's actionable because it's really related to, you know, your work or your business, someone's going to tell out. you about it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I, I guess like um, in conclusion, I just um, like would encourage the listeners to really explore the whole area around personalized health and preventative medicine, because, uh, you know, the things that people die from nowadays are not singular events like diseases of, uh, you know, like flu or something like that, but it's mostly lifelong metabolic diseases. So these are lifelong processes that you can act to, um, to reduce or prevent to some extent. Plus, you know, the body is really the thing that um, everything else is is based on. And there's a very great deal of depth to dig into here. So we talked a little about sleep and sports and stuff like that. But um, I also find that everything to do with mental health, so things like meditation and psychotherapy, um, et cetera, are super important for just 
your well-being and for uh, ability to get the things that you care about uh, done on a daily basis. So I would just really encourage digging into this and uh, learning because it's 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 a very important system and it's worth it to invest into it. Fantastic. I, well, yeah, I think that's awesome. Yeah. Awesome. And I'll send you the links to the articles that I write about this stuff. And, um, you know, if you have any comments or questions or someday we'll uh, have another conversation, I would love that because, you know, like I said, I love the rationalist community. It's one of the communities full of really, really smart people who think about things in novel uh, and interesting ways. Awesome. Well, you took the next word right out of my mouth. I was going to ask for those links. So perfect. Um, okay. I think it's been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, guys. Have a nice day. Thanks. Thanks. You too. Should we get into listener feedback and things? Let's do it. All right. There's a joke. I'm assuming a joke comment on... uh, the subreddit for the last episode the 98 percent likelihood that this episode's about metaculus uh-huh. it says 60 to 98 percent is a very wide range but it's episode 60 yes yeah. yes it is oh I don't oh th- that's even better then yeah also but yeah, i mean I, episode 60 98 percent i listened to that episode and it was really interesting cool yeah totally agree that that was awesome did you sign up for metaculus yet not yet i should I signed up and I have some, I'm in accounting, so the end of my month is a bit, always a bit light. So I signed up at work and just answered a bunch of questions while I was there. That's awesome. Okay, I'll do that. I've got time. I hope you have a red pick for this week because I did not read through the ones that I have. And so I am not prepared to present them. If you don't, that's okay. We'll just skip skip it this week. Not rat pick. A rat chat subject. Rat chat. Did you ever watch Siflinoli? No, I think that was before your time. It was a brief MTV show with sock puppets, which I thought was really fun. But they had rock facts, and the intro to that section was one of the one of the rock facts, rock facts, rock facts. Rock facts, rock facts, rock facts. <laughs> I think we should do something like that. That like, sounds funny. And like borrow a drummer and just have him bang out this thing. We go one of the one of the rat chat, rat chat, rat chat. I could dig it as long as, long as you do the noise. I, I I'm not very high energy. Okay. <laughs> M from emails has a question. If we would like to change the world for the better, it seems quite reasonable to have more rationalists in it. And I agree. That's kind of why I did the HPMOR audiobook. It's why I do this. I'm hoping that some people will get sucked into it through this sort of thing. Uh, they, they continue. And seemingly a... Uh, no, it seems as if a lot of children do get influenced by their parents on who they become as a person, myself included. Thing, for the good, by the way. Thanks, mom and dad. Also, keeping in mind from uh, the Malthusian trap, shouldn't rationalists do their part in bettering the society as a whole by introducing to it more people trained in the art of rationality from a young age? People who will be more altruistic, open-minded, better scientists and researchers, and so on. Seems to me a very reasonable thing to do and a big influence on deciding if you should have children. If you do not have any other reasons why you would not want to. A young mind is much easier to change and adapt or even think up new ideas. Another part would be trying to convert, I'm making this sound like a cult, aren't I, as many people as possible, but that's a more difficult task. And see, I'm I'm all about the converting, although not necessarily using that particular word. I mean, that's, like I said, that's the reason I do this sort of thing too. Well, that and it's fun. But (laughs) to to try to 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 get it out there more. And I think HPMR in particular has been really successful in doing that, which again, is all Eliezer. So fucking awesome. I just made a podcast of it. But um, I think one of the reasons uh, the the rationality is important, and I know I've said this before, is because as we continue to increase lifespan and eventually get indefinite lifespans, then we can no longer count on killing all the old people who don't disagree with us through old age. And uh, we actually have to learn how to best incorporate new evidence and change our minds uh, as opposed to letting the opposition die off. And so I think the rationality is vital as we head into the future. But I also, I realize that having children is one of the easiest and most effective ways to spread an ideology. And which is one of the reasons why religions that focus on that are successful. 
I banning, also, banning contraception is a good mimetic move for things that are hard to teach adult or convince adults, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, there's a magic man that watches you masturbate. <laughs> Only sounds reasonable if you've been brought up to believe that. But I think, first of all, it feels like cheating to me because the young minds are so vulnerable. It's not like you're going in there and convincing someone with good rationalist arguments. You're just hacking into their brain from when they're young and it's an important it's an important fight isn't cheating you know a legit move right (laughs) it's called technique (laughs) that's right so yes in an important fight you just want to win and you don't care if there's cheating but i i I think if we have to rely on outbreeding the opposition we'll lose anyway that's fair but maybe we need to keep a critical mass yeah yeah that too i mean the shakers managed to abstinence themselves out of existence, which is too bad because they seemed pretty groovy. Quakers? Shakers. Shakers. Who are like the Quakers, except not allowed to have sex. Okay. Which is probably one of the reasons they shook so much. <laughs> that might be it, yeah. I don't know. Uh, uh, but I, I, I understand the, the reasonableness of that particular argument. I just hate the conclusion and I am not going to have kids myself. I don't know. How do you feel about, about the situation as someone who has considered procreating? I considered and disregarded the idea years ago. Oh, you did? Yeah, I don't know. Oh, I, I thought you were still a little bit on the fence about it. Not even a little. Oh, okay. Oh, no, I've, I've never really wanted kids. Okay. Um, did I not come across that way during our kids episode? I think I mentioned being briefly like attracted to the idea, but not, I mean... At the end of the day, I couldn't handle three years of poor sleep and constantly having human shit under my fingernails and, uh, you know, the constant anxiety of like, is this thing going to die and it'd be my fault? Mm -hmm. Um, But like, I think, you know, all right, let me articulate this. Um, Anecdotally, Julia Galef mentioned that her parents, the way that they raised her and her brother played a big influence on how they turned out. Mm -hmm. And it was largely just being like, treating them like people. Mm-hmm. And if they said, you know, look, is this fair? Why, why are we doing this? They would say, you know what? I thought about it and I think you're right. No. And like if you, if you get that once every few months from your parents, I think that that is a big thing that like, Hey, good reasoning can actually play a big role in my life. Yeah. Um, I know my but, evangelical streak comes from being raised as an, as a Jehovah's witness. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think if your goal is to like, just, get into people's heads when they're malleable. Um, I had very like informative uh, instructors in school, Um, you know, especially when they're like old enough, I guess, to take philosophy classes. Um, You know, at that point you get a lot of people who are already like super gridlocked into whatever they believe. But I think you expose young adults to like what a real argument looks like and what it's like to encounter a position that you disagree with. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember lots of good exercises be like, you know, who believes, um, evolution should be taught in schools or who believes it shouldn't. And you know, people would raise their hands either way and they would say, okay, cool. The people who raised their hands saying it should be taught in schools, you guys come together with an argument about why it shouldn't and then vice versa for the other group. And just the idea of like trying to put forward a compelling position for, for an argument you disagree with is good practice. And I think, um, you know, I guess what I'm getting at is if, if, if your goal is to maximize the number of new rationalists through indoctrination, you might do really good teaching. Mm-hmm. You only have so many kids, you know, a dozen is probably at the super high end. Yeah. Um, but you know, more likely two or three. So granted they could go on to have their own, but who has that many generations to keep track of? So, um, well, I mean, that's, that's where the long-term thinking comes in. Like the Catholic church is just great about this thing. Cause they don't care about what happens in the next few years or the next few decades. Even, I mean, they do to an extent, but what they're really looking at is what happens generations down the line. Yeah, I think they've done really fucking well for themselves. Yeah. They're like they when when they force uh, people to convert, right? It's there's this old saying, I don't remember who said it and it's nice and pithy, but the whole a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. And the Catholic Church response is that's fine. We don't give a fuck if you actually believe or not. As long as you raise your kids this way and your kids raise their kids this way, your grandkids are going to believe. So fuck you, we win. <laughs> yeah. I think rationality doesn't have the same stick that we can hit people with, though. So, like, mm. um, the other thing is that I strongly suspect that many of us 
don't see a 10 generation down the line thing timeline that we can plan for. Right. Right. You know, so if the world's going to be radically different in a century, we don't have, you know, a dozen generations to work through. Um, I also have this into not really an intuition. It seems that a lot of who people are is based on their genes. That, uh, that is, (laughs) I, that sounds stupid to say now that I've said it out loud because yeah, duh, of course. But uh, I just mean to the point where it doesn't matter all that much how you're raised. I mean, it matters to an extent, but your genes tend to matter more. And so I think, God, like when my dad told me that he was secretly an atheist the whole time, I was like, you motherfucker. And then like a month later, I was like, huh, that kind of bred true. Like, even though they raised me strictly in this super fundamentalist religion, my dad was an atheist. My mom's kind of like, eh, you know, whatever. And so despite the conditioning of being in this religion, I broke atheist anyway, as did both my brothers. It, 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 it seems the genes kind of overwhelmed the, the, the education part of that. Or it could be that they weren't thorough enough in their indoctrination. I, I, that's, that's possible. I, you, you, you're the one who lived through it. I mean, did they seem like they were being super sincere all the time or did they just yeah. say, go through the motions? I, I'm not sure if I would be able to tell the difference, but it certainly seemed like they were sincere. Like, I was legit shocked when my dad came out as an atheist, secret atheist. That's Yeah, that's super surprising. I wonder what value they thought they were giving you by raising you that way. Oh, you know, community and all the all the standard... Aren't there less tr- ostracizing communities, like the Unitarian Church or something? Well, and all the general religious propaganda that you need religion to teach your kids morals and all that other stuff that people didn't know any better until fairly recently, you know? Till 20 years ago <laughs> I don't know <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah that I wonder if so uh, you know it, there that goes to his point though like if you want more rationalists in the world you need people who are rationalists propagating their genes because if you try to teach someone who's innately not that way it won't stick I don't know I suspect that religiosity is more nurture than nature yeah but I mean you have a good anecdote that that is counter evidence. So, yeah. um, But I mean, on the other hand, I still have that evangelical fervor that was, that was brought to me by my religion. It's just, it has been usurped into the, into evangelizing for atheism and, and rationalism, depending on what period of my life I was in, you know, um, like when I was in my teens and twenties, I was a huge crusader for atheism. Yeah. I went through that phase too. And then I realized that, it was a lot of the same arguments and it wasn't, it lost its fun pretty quickly, Mm -hmm. but I was bouncing back from a very mild religious upbringing. So if I was bouncing back from a very serious one, I could imagine being way in it, way further in it for longer. Um, Oh shit. I had something I was going to say about, uh, well, I had something. Let's just pretend I said something really smart there. Cool. Steven, that was amazing. Thank you. You have changed my mind. Uh I will have all the children now. Perfect. (laughs) No, it wasn't about, it wasn't about procreating. I can't remember what it was, but it was, uh, you know, Oh, I don't know what I was going to say. You you guys also, you and your brothers became, you know, atheists in the last 20, 30 years, uh, like the last generation or so. Mm-hmm. But atheism as a whole has been going way up during that time too, right? Mm-hmm. So that seems to be more counter evidence that it was genetically based. It's true. Um, yeah. Because real, non-religiosity has on the, been on the upswing for decades anyway. Um, and, you know, I think even just... 20, 30 years ago was some fi- some sub 5% or something, and now yeah. it's up to almost 20%. Yeah. Um, that is that is faster than than breeding atheists could right. account for. It's just, I, I think, propagation of ideas. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, the more... I see things like rationality and, and, you know, critical thinking and open-minded discussion of ideas being more popular going forward because that just seems to be more required to have a life in the first world yeah um you're interacting with people that you know didn't grow up in your bubble every day um so whether you know it's at work or a lot of people you know there's a correlation between non-religiosity and liberalism and higher education Mm -hmm. because you know you go away from home typically you're not surrounded by the same safety nets or bubble walls or whatever that you were raised in i've heard them referred to as lightning rods you get hit struck by the the lightning of new knowledge and realization, but then you have this community to ground you where all that gets channeled through you and you renew your faith. Hmm. And so if you are taken away from that, you don't have that lightning rod anymore. And when the lightning hits you, it <laughs> blows the roof off your mind, man. I can dig it. Yeah, that might be it. But 
Anyway, I predict this will go on the way up, but whether or not it's happening fast enough to save the world, I don't know. So, And uh, I'll probably mention this at some point, but Jesus didn't have any children, and yet his influence is huge. So not necessarily, you don't necessarily have to have children to, to impact the future. That's true. Just be a great cult leader. Yeah. Oh, shit. Yudkowsky. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, no, no. Scott Alexander is the one true caliph, sir. <laughs> I don't know. He he's less of a like upfront he's public less, figure. Yes, right? and I think less charismatic. That's exactly the word I was going to use okay. a little bit. I mean, well, no, that's a good word for it. That's what I was thinking of. But he, it's not. I think he's less breaking. He's not doing a lot of like new ground, new breaking new ground. Mm-hmm. He's digging awesome trenches in this new ground that's been broken, and okay. he's and he's kicking tons of ass there. But. um Going more for know. depth rather than breadth? Maybe. Okay. Well, he's, he also covers, covers more topics than, than the sequences or something, but I wonder if he'd be half as successful without Less Wrong having been a precursor, yeah. right? Yeah. So I suspect not. Well, and as early training, you know? That too. I mean, he was one of the first rationalists on the boards there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's true. As you vain. Yeah, I mean, get, on, get online and, you know... It, I think my advice would be if you're trying to increase rationalists, get online and proselytize through whatever medium you want. Mm-hmm. Um, grab a microphone like we do. Uh, talk to, you know, if you want to make your life out of it, you know, run, um, you know, some sort of an education thing, whether it's like a, I don't know, work at CFAR or something, right? Yeah. Um, I think, you know what? I think a lot of it comes down to comparative advantage. For some people, having kids is one of the best things they could do in part because they're good at it and they enjoy it. Whereas for people like us, we would not be good at it and we would not enjoy it. And our, our skills are probably better put to other uses. Yeah, that's probably about right. Yeah. That said, you know, if you're going to have kids, I steal every incentive to make them, you know, young little rationalists. I think right. that'd be awesome. Um, you know, I don't know how they'd go through public school not being, you know, or being raised to not capitulate to stupid authority arguments or you know, if they can't get along with their peers or something because their peers are all regular kids, but mm. um, there's got to be some way to make that work. Are so. you worried that we are drawing, that we have already drawn our bottom line? Do you remember that post? Yeah. Okay. But what, what line are you thinking that we've drawn? Well, that we've we already decided that we don't want kids and we don't want to accept that raising kids is the best way to go forward with this. And so now we're making all the arguments that we can find against it. Mm. That we already decided where we want to be. And we're trying to get there as opposed to looking at things the way they actually are. Now that you pointed it out, I still don't feel that way. It's Given what, that I don't want to have kids, what else can I do is how I'm phrasing the question. Yeah. And I'm not thinking, all right, now that I'm starting, you know, picture, picking my life from scratch, how do I want to do it to maximize this? But I still also think that if, you know, you're teaching 60 kids a day, mm-hmm. you know, at a college or something, and you get through to two of them a semester, that's still more kids than you could ever have over a few years. Mm-hmm. So... If that's bottom line thinking, it's not jumping out of me. All right. Well, there you have our non-answer. <laughs> Thank you for the email, though. It sparked some interesting conversation. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm not. If, if someone's looking for like instructions on what to do, I'm not even prepared to touch that. Mm-hmm. I'm prepared to give give my thoughts on things, but you can't ask me what you want, what what to do with your life. Do whatever you feel like doing, and then kick ass at it. That's my advice. Yeah. At this point, Stephen and me went on a 20 minute digression about the Marvel Cinematic Universe. If you would like to hear that, it's up on our Patreon for subscribers. All right. Next question. Okay. Ah, yes. Uh, James on our website, thebasinconspiracy.com, posted in the comments on the Getting Schooled episode, I feel like it was overlooked that the reason charter schools exist is to privatize schools to divert... (laughs) <laughs> is to privatize schools to divert money from poor minorities and unions specifically. The more the system is dicked around, the worse it is, and the more they can cut slash pocket the money from it. The Starve the Beast strategy is a well-known tactic for conservative, pro-business, political operators. So, yeah, the claim is charter schools exist specifically to pull money away from poor and minority groups. Um, I am not an economist or a school scientist i have no idea if that's true i i could see other compelling arguments being made that like um i happen to live in like an area without great schools and i want my kid to go to a great school and i can provide for that so like that's why i want it to exist yeah. not just to fuck minorities and poor kids but um i can see that it also does that but i don't know if that's like the purpose i think i kind of want to disagree with him to the point where i think the opposite is true like if you live the the reason 
people move to really fancy pricey neighborhoods is at least 80% of the reason that I've ever heard is because they want their kids to go to good, good schools. Because in America, at least, schools are funded by property taxes. So you go to the most expensive area you possibly can afford to live in, and then your kids go to the schools there, and they get a good education. And that, that is kind of what helps fuck the poor schools, right? Is because they live in poor areas with poor property taxes. And I, I think if there was a charter school rule where every person can get $2,000 to send their kids somewhere else if they wanted to, the rich people in the rich areas would just keep sending their schools kids to the public school because it's just as good. I mean, I've seen some really fucking nice public schools out there in the rich areas, whereas the people in the poor neighborhoods are the ones with the schools that are crumbling, that have horrible edu- um, discipline issues within the classrooms where people are just making noise and fucking around with the teacher. And those are the ones that would most benefit from going to someplace that isn't falling apart. Yeah, I can see that too. I clearly don't have a very strong opinion on this. Okay. Um, I, I just, it's like, I, I, can't, I see his point in a way because the way that these things are supposed to work is that all of society gets together and then provides free schools for everyone. And in theory, once you start taking that money away and giving it to people who want to go to different schools, it's the rich people that want to put their kids in private schools. So they're just getting extra money and they're taking it away from the pot of people. But when it comes down to it in the real world, the poor area schools are the worst ones. And they're the ones where you most want to pull your kids out and put them somewhere else. I, my only thought on this really is I remember the first time that I learned that school funding comes from the, like the surrounding neighborhood. Mm-hmm. I was so flabbergasted by that. I didn't believe it until I was able to verify that with somebody else. Uh, that blew my fucking mind. That makes no sense. Even I think I, I learned this in like junior high or high school you know, as a, a young, you know, young high school or something, but it was, I was like a kid and I was like, there's no way that's fucking true. You're telling, cause all that would do is keep the poor areas poor and enhance the rich neighborhoods. Yep. There's no way that it's that blatantly in, unequal. <laughs> and it turns out it was. And so my only thought on this really is like, that's some horse shit. Mm. It should be, uh, not funded from your surrounding neighborhood. Yeah. I can see how it got that way. I can see kind of the reasoning for it, but I can't, for the life of me, get why uh, maybe the poorest schools in the country get some support from the government or something, but it's clearly not enough. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, teachers having to buy supplies for their kids to use, or like not everyone having access to a computer. Yeah. You know, uh, when I was in elementary school, I think that was when we first, like, my first time using a computer it was one of the you know, green text on black background, old school computers. I think clearly not cutting edge for the day. But they were like, they taught us on them because they're like, hey, you know what? This computer thing's really taking off. We should, kids should know how to type and shit. Mm-hmm. Um, the idea that, you know, there are kids now who don't have access to like learn the skills that's going to get them like real jobs blows my fucking mind because mm-hmm. their schools are funded by the poor neighborhoods. Yeah. I, I'm expressing, I'm, I'm running in a loop because that still boggles <laughs> my mind how anyone can look at this and be like, that makes sense. This is good. Let's not change this. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know what to say. And I just, I disagree with the, with the concept also that if the cost of sending a kid to a public school is $2,000 a year, which is what I think I heard for vouchers around here, um, and you pull in a charter school, no, no public school, because that's at least in Colorado, the, the proposed initiative. And I don't remember where it went because I don't have kids and I didn't track it, but the proposed initiative was it costs, uh, the state $2,000 a year to put the kid through public school. And so if you pull your kid out of public school and take him to private school, we'll give you that $2,000. And, you know, it seems to me that at that point, you aren't actually costing the system anything. You sure this, the, the school gets $2,000 less for your kid. But on the other hand, it doesn't have to teach your kid. So it's saving those $2,000. So it's a break even proposition, right? And I know that's not like literally true, like a school that was completely empty would still have the costs of paying its teachers and and keeping the building maintained. So it's not perfectly scalable. But if if the estimate is $2,000 a kid, then giving that to the parents who are pulling their kids out should be a net zero thing. Yeah, but what can anyone afford a private school for two grand a year? Well... <laughs> not not the private schools as they exist now because they're for rich people. Right. But if there was a thing where you could get 2000 a year for training kids, then possibly in the poorest neighborhood, someone might be able to set up something. Hmm. 
I know that there are like some communities of homeschoolers that do, you know, where it's like people are basically like teacher certified and stuff and they kind of do like a small neighborhood thing. Mm-hmm. I think largely this is done in like a religious context where, you know, let's not show them the books that have evolution and stuff in it. But right. um, there are, I'm sure, uh, non-religious approaches to doing this. And that sounds like the kind of thing that, you know, could cost under two grand a kid per year. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's interesting. It'd be hard because I was thinking two grand a kid. That's if you get 20 kids, that's one classroom. That's only 40,000 a year. I don't think that's enough to run a classroom and pay a teacher salary. Oh, yeah. You'll need volunteer teachers or something, maybe. Yeah. And probably either rented space. I guess it depends on how big the group is, right? If somebody just has like a really big, uh, well, no, I don't know. I was going to say like half a dozen people could hang out in a room, but that's not really enough, is it? No. No, I don't know. Yeah, I don't have a very informed opinion on this. Yeah. I'm trying to do that Robin Hanson thing where, well, not just Robin Hanson, but he brought it to mind um, on his on his episode with Sam Harris where he, per the chapter in The Elephant in the Brain on Conversation, not saying something when there's a topic that's up makes you look poor in front of your, your peers. Right. Because, you know, you're, you're showing that you don't have a tool for this particular conversation. And then, you know, that signals to them, oh, they might not have tools for other things that I could care about later. So that's why everyone's so eager to talk all the time because they could show off what they're talking. They could show off that they're useful for other things that might actually matter. But to fight that impulse, I feel like it's important to say, I really have no idea okay. when I really have no idea. So rather than make up one on the spot, I'm going to just say that sounds possible, but I, I'm going to sit this one out. So, okay. If nothing else, I don't think the intention is to starve a public institution. I think it is to provide people with other options and maybe as a result that might that might end up happening. But on the other hand, it also wouldn't happen if the public institution was even halfway doing its job, right? Maybe. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. I'm ready to... That is all I have for feedback for this week. Sounds good. Uh, Matt, you wrote another great question that I haven't forgotten about. We're going to get to it. Um, but I want to give it more time. So... Um, it's my opinion from what I've seen of uh, Jordan Peterson, mm-hmm. um, this public figure in Canada who apparently fills some of the same niche that Sam Harris fills, you know, uh, not afraid to say things that are challenging to the left and, you know, no, not, not a fan of like uh, the liberal craziness that's shutting down, you know, public speakers on campuses and whatever. It's like uh, he's, he's filling that role, I think a bit. And it's my impression that the guy's a fucking crank <laughs> and that he says a lot of in, like wackadoo shit that uh-huh. makes uh that is unsalvageable and that couldn't exist in a sound mind so like i'll hear things like oh yeah you know um uh liberal feminists aren't against islam because deep down they're really seeking dominant male uh um or, or domineering males in their lives he said that Yes, Holy I, shit. I, I, I sent I sent David a, a sound bite. I don't know what the full context was. It was him yeah. on some podcast or something. Um, so, rather than a rat chat, what I want to ask is like what people's thoughts are on Jordan Peterson. Oh, if, no. If, no, 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 okay. not, not, not in a mean way. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My no, no, not even in a mean way. I just mean you are inviting a firestorm. My impression after talking with David is that um, I was eventually moved to the position that it might be like outsiders hearing about Sam Harris and they hear some crazy things and they're like, Oh, this guy must be fucking nuts. Okay. But once you hear the guy in context, you know, I think Harris holds very few stupid ideas. Um, can I tell you what I think of him? Of yeah. Peterson. Yeah. Okay. So Sam Harris, uh, I don't think it's a fair comparison because you can listen to Sam Harris talk on one topic for an hour and you're like, Oh, okay. That, I mean, maybe I disagree with his particular opinion, but he is a thoughtful person who has put some effort into thinking about this and he seems pretty sane, you know? I I have sat down and listened to Peterson for more than an hour, like multiple hours, two, three hours probably at this point, and I've given up because the first thing I saw from him was fucking awesome. It was a a TV interview where this reporter was just trying to gotcha him, right? And she, she was pushing buttons instead of having a map. So uh, she pushed this button and expected a gotcha in return. And instead, he was like, no, this I'm not playing your game. Here's why you what you're saying is bullshit. And she kept trying to get back there and get him into this gotcha position. And he just wouldn't do it. He's like, no, I, you're not going to get me to say the stupid thing. Here's why. And it was it was beautiful. It was a great example of the maps versus buttons sort of thing where uh, he didn't have buttons to press to spit out an answer. And I thought it was great. But 
that being said, I think his map is semi incoherent. Because <laughs> I think I've that's seen, my impression as well. Yeah, I've seen him talk for an hour, and every now and then he has something really like interesting and cool to say. But for the most part, his thoughts don't seem to relate to each other even that well or the rest of the world and it's just like it is it is discombobulated brain stew that's all coming out and you can like pick out the gems of oh that's really cool but it doesn't seem to cohere into anything legible so, in my opinion no i think i mean from what i he, he shows up a lot on the sam harris subreddit where they talk about like the newest episodes and stuff and between episodes they'll throw out random bullshit that's you know throwing shade at peterson or some other stuff right. and uh um my first exposure to him was on his first episode on harris's podcast where within the first 20 minutes um peterson threw out some definition of truth that was like basically what's called pragmatism it's true if it's useful okay um and he insisted that he's being more Darwinian than Harris because his actually, you know, counted on like it was useful if it was, in, you know, encouraged survival. And I've never heard of a person that uses the phrase more Darwinian than you who wasn't a religious <laughs> fundamentalist. Right. And then I listened to him for the next 90 minutes, refuse to come down on like objective truth being an actual thing. Right. Um, and I was like, the, I, this guy must be some religious nut job. Who is this guy? And I Google him and he is. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, Peterson's a religious nut job. Yes. He's, oh. he's, well, he's, he's like a new age apologist. Okay. Um, so the reason that he wants this crazy bastardized version of the word truth out there is that he can say Christianity is true and it's true that it's raining outside. I did not um, realize he was religious. Uh, to the best I can tell. Okay. So whether or not, I mean, he, he also did an AMA a couple of days ago and that's why he was back on Harris's subreddit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the top question was like, uh, maybe I'll just find it so I don't sound disingenuous. Give me just one second here. Um, like a lot of his answers to me end up feeling like a word salad. Like you didn't say anything. I think that that's the one thing that I really dislike about his presentation as well. Um, so like, you know, Harris can put a, across an at least coherent idea in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's entirely plausible that there are ideas out there that are too complex to get across in less than eight hours. But I mean, that sounds a lot like, uh, <laughs> I, I'm suspicious of that because that sounds like, you know, hey, put up this huge upfront investment. I mean, you can, you can explain the benefits of something as complex as rationality in just a few minutes. Mm -hmm. A few sentences gets across the general point, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you need more than a few hours to explain your position, I wonder if it's too convoluted. Um, so anyway, the top, the, top, the top question on the AMA was... Um, Dr. Peterson, you've claimed that the atrocities of Nazi Germany came out of a loss of belief in God. However, only about 1.5% 1, 1. of Germans in 1939 claimed to lack religious belief, and many of the anti-Semitic beliefs propagated by the Nazis were inspired by those Christian figures like Martin Luther. How can you explain the populist spread of Nazism in Germany as a result of atheism when historical facts do not suggest such a conclusion? And I remember that that was the top voted answer when I looked and he hadn't answered it yet, but it looks like he answered it uh, about an hour and a half in. Oh, and he says... Sorry. He says, Nazism, and athe Nazism was an atheist doctrine. So was Marxism. Well, I mean, Marxism was, but Nazism certainly wasn't. So I kind of agree. But to him, I think he has to say it is because anything's, quote, not religious if you're not doing good. So by that definition, good Christian Nazis are not religious, but good atheists are religious. Uh -huh. So again, when, when, when you can say truth is uh, whatever is quote useful, then truth is whatever you want and nothing matters and there's no facts. Yeah. Yeah. And so he's just allowed, he's allowed to be the arbiter that says they weren't religious despite them, you know, wearing, uh, you know, in God, God with us on their belt buckles yeah. and, uh, you know, Hitler's famous, um, what God, uh, God stand or he had, he opened, he had this big thing that he would say during his, his speeches, some God related quote. Okay. Um, it's not coming to me, but like, so despite all that, and despite, you know, the, the churches, you know, commemorating Hitler's birthday and stuff, um, you can oh, that wasn't religion. No, no, that, that couldn't have been because they were doing the wrong thing. Uh -huh. No, no, real religion is people doing the right thing. So, you know, Enosh, when you, when you give money to the poor, you're, you're being, you're religious. I mean, that's yeah. assuming I give money to the poor, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm grabbing an atheist and saying something. Right, right, right yeah. So, I know what um, you mean. So, I don't know. I don't know if we have to keep all this in there, if it's, if it's a really good uh, conversation starter. But the reason I brought it up was because... I think David's super intelligent and he convinced me that I'm missing something. Right. That's so, the weird thing um, that there is a fair number of really intelligent people in the rationalist community who seem to be really taken by this guy. 
and I don't get what I'm missing. First thing I need to do is finish reading Scott Alexander's review of Peterson's book, 12 yeah, even, something or other. Even Scott Alexander seemed kind of smitten by him. And I was like, this is so weird. Yeah, at least Alexander, I think, has the... He's like the... Um, was it that Aristotle quote that it's the mark of an intelligent person that they can entertain an idea without believing it? Yes, yes. So I think, that I think the epitome of that. He really is. I mean, he even talks in the beginning of that that essay, some of the insane shit that Peterson said, and uh, he's like, "Well, running past all that, this book actually had some cool stuff in it." Uh, <laughs> but he's like the one person I know that that can do that, right? I remember um, near the end of the Less Strong Community, uh, someone made a post of just a whole bunch of rationalist commenters walk into a coffee shop, right? And what what they do with that exactly? Uh, no, no, no. It was, it was, they walk in the coffee shop and there's someone there saying that this coffee was made with the blood of, of some children somewhere. And so, uh, Gwern goes and thinks, how can I do this? And sets up a very elaborate self blinded test as how he can test which coffee is it that has the blood, the children's blood in it, which one isn't. And it was, it was just typically perfect Gwern, right? And, uh, Scott Alex, and it was just, you know, kind of a, a caricature of each of the, uh, big commenters on the boards. And Scott Alexander's was, uh, Yvain thinks about this for a while, makes a long impassioned post about why it's a good thing to, to drink coffee made with the blood of children and ends it with, I'm doing all this to strongman this position as str- as good as I can before I come back tomorrow and just rip it into tiny pieces because it deserves to be ripped apart. And he leaves the coffee shop and everyone's like, let's drink the blood of children. <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> you meant steel man, not straw man, right? I meant steel, yeah. Did I say straw man? Yeah. Yeah, I meant steel man. Like he's really steel manning it. So it goes down forever. But the lesson everyone takes from it is drinking the blood of children is great. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I think that's that's a good. I think Alexander is one of those people who can argue very convincingly for just about anything. Well, and because uh, I mean, he does. He's it, good. It, yeah, yeah, it's great. No, I think I like it. Um, so yeah, I just brought that up because that's what was on my mind today. So it wasn't exactly something I can point out with a link, but um, I'm wondering if like Pearson's as nutty as I think he is, or if uh, if I'm totally missing something. And if there is, if there's something that you can point me to, that's way less than eight hours of my time. Right. If there's a thirty, I mean you know, every insane thing that Harris says, I can point you to something that you can read in 10 minutes and that gives you his full position on it. Um, it's, I don't know. Uh, is it, is it, you know, I sure have any ideas that take more than several hours to like convey. Um, like it's one thing to like fully understand it to the point where, you know, you can yeah. build it from scratch, you know, yeah. a la Feynman. But, um, you know, my counterpoint to David when he mentioned that was like, I could explain the like history of the universe in 15 minutes. Right. Right. Now, granted, you can build a universe from scratch from that explanation, but you could get the overview. I don't know. There's, I mean, Eliezer said once that he had to write the sequences in order to, uh, in order to convince people that AI is an actual problem because there was just so much inferential distance between where the world was and uh, that he had to explain, you know, reams and reams of stuff. And he managed to do it in a, entertaining way that made you want to keep reading it you know and he did his job i don't know he maybe he could have did said it in less but the sequences were kind of a masterpiece of crossing that inferential divide and and giving people all the information they need i don't know if it could have been done in less but, but i the, think the, the case for artificial could, intelligence safety could be made in less yeah getting people to believe it is different right right so yeah. just getting people to know what the fuck you're talking about shouldn't take that long it, it i mean it, i think you could come across that in an hour right? yeah well i mean um, less I, i've been able to summarize the ai thing in a few sentences before yeah, yeah. yeah same I, I mean at parties and yeah. um whether or not they believe the conclusion is different but uh, at least i can lay out my argument in just a few minutes yeah. and uh i i'm suspicious of somebody that says my position is too complex to do that yeah. it would take me eight hours to explain to you what my position is and at the end i hope you took good notes because you know, you don't have to listen to the whole thing again. So, um, I mean, I've heard both the positions for why, you know, it's, it might be important to research racial differences and for why we shouldn't do that, or at the very least never talk about it in public with people who aren't already trained in this sort of, uh, in this field. And I think they're both good points and I don't know which way I come down on it personally, but they were both explained to me in the matter of minutes, you know, And that's a fairly touchy subject, right? Uh-huh. Um, yeah, I... 
I don't really know where to go there. So I'm, I'm trying to be as genuine, as generous as possible because, uh, you know, I keep calling out David, but he was the guy I was talking to and he's been on the show. So I think he's okay with it. He had said, I don't think you're engaging the principle of charity here. And I said, you I know tried. what? I th- well, no, no, but, but what I wasn't, I think oh, okay. I, I stopped. And I was like, you know what? You're totally right. I heard some insane shit. I don't know how anybody that is worth listening to could say these things, but I'm totally willing to, you know, grant that there's things that, I mean, I've seen memes of Harris saying that we should nuke the Middle East, right? right so right. like, which he doesn't say, um, you know. Well, I went into Peterson charitably because I had heard a few good things about him already. And the first thing I saw of him was this awesome interview where he just showed calm and respect and basic, like, rationalist judo on this, this uh, TV reporter person. So I was like, this guy's awesome. And that's why I went on to keep giving him second chances and watch a couple hours of his stuff and before I finally gave up with like this guy's incoherent. So I think maybe the way what my best my best preferred outcome here would be if anyone is like oh yeah Peterson's awesome check out this 30 minutes or less video um or this short essay or something but I don't want to read a 600 page book or watch an 8 hour lecture right just cuz I mean that's maybe it sounds lazy but it's I don't think I don't I think that's fair I can't spend 8 hours engaging everything that I think is dumb to see or let me rephrase that. Or no, that's that's roughly what I'm trying to say. Um, I can't spend that much time on everything that I'm trying to consider because there's too many ideas. I can't spend that much time on everything, right? So, yeah, if anyone has like a cool short thing to send me, I'd love to see it. Um, but I'm trying to see what's going on here and which way the dust will settle. So I think I put my cards on the table. Cool. Otherwise, uh, let us thank a person. And thank Kyle, our sound engineer, for, as always, making the sound awesome. So... Thank you, Seriously, Kyle. yeah, Kyle, you fucking rock. Yeah. Uh, oh, 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 we got to thank the people that did our music. Oh, yes, thank you. I made a note to you, Nash, that we forgot to do it the last couple episodes. So big shout out to our, uh, we've got different composers for the intro and the outro. I'm assuming you have them down. So David did some of the music for um, Methods of Rationality, right? Yes, David uh, did the fight scene with Sprout. Yeah. <laughs> and he uh, he did one other piece, which is not coming to me now. I'm really sorry, David. Uh, but he's done he's done some at least two pieces for the Methods of Rationality podcast. I'm trying to think of other original scores. I know you credited them all during the show. Anyway, yeah, let us know which one it was, and you'll get a shout out there. Thank you to David Greer for composing our intro music, and to the Sumerki Project for composing our outro music. The whatever that rock and roll one was supposed to be like a three episode placeholder, and it ended up lasting like two years. So I'm loving this. I uh, I've listened to the episodes that have this coming on there, and it's it's more relaxing and chill. And I think it totally hits more of the vibe I'm going for. So excellent. Yeah. Love it. And Kyle, our sound engineer, another shout out and to our Patreon supporter for this episode. This episode's Patreon supporter is thank you to Andrew Morosco for being our Patreon supporter for this week. Well, I mean, he's our Patreon supporter every week, but he's the one we specifically thank this week. Yes. Thank you. This episode rather. Yeah. This episode. Yeah. yeah. It's a whole thing. We're all con- time, you know, time's confusing. Yes. Um, anyway, thanks Andrew. Makes a big difference for us. And thanks to everyone who helps spread the word, tell their friends, leave in iTunes reviews, anything like that. Yeah, no, I, yeah, it makes a big difference. Thanks a lot, guys. It helps a lot. Okay, I think that's everything. I think that's everything. All right, have a good night, everyone. We'll be back in two weeks.